Hey guys, welcome back to Banking on Cultura. I am your host, Victoria Jen Rodriguez, and I'm so excited to have you here. I decided to give you guys a behind the scenes look over the next few episodes of what went down at the Secure the Big Bag and Love Unapologetically Summit that I hosted in New York City back in November 2023 with Kara Elwell. You know, a lot of us right now are thinking about the new year, thinking about our goals, thinking about what intentions we're gonna set for ourselves, and some of us might feel a little stuck, right? And unsure of what are the next steps that we need to take. And so the next few episodes is going to take you on a journey, a journey of exploration, a journey of reinvention, but most importantly, a journey of self-reflection. So you can go into the new year prepared, right? And you can have a clear understanding, but most importantly, real strategies for you to go after and secure the big bag and love unapologetically, both yourself as well as the people that you love most in your life. So make sure to have your cafecito, make sure to get comfortable, honey, because you are going to be edutained, okay? Entertained, but also educated. Enjoy. My name is Lauren Taylor. Um, that's that's me. <laughs> um, I am from Charleston, South Carolina. I am a divorce lawyer, hence why I'm moderating this panel. Um, also, just a little bit about me. I am in business with my husband as well. He is also a lawyer. Um, he recently got bought out of his firm and joined my firm. Um, so I am very intrigued by the topic that we're discussing today, and I've actually had um, a little bit of a pre-interview call with both Calvin and Crystal, and I think their perspectives and how they've navigated this space is just so interesting to see from someone that's newly getting into it. So I'm going to, that's me, and I'm going to pause now and let them give their full little introduction. So I am Crystal Etienne. I am the CEO and founder of Ruby Love. I'm best known as one of the top tech black women from 2019 that um, did a $15 million deal. So I'm like one of the ones at that time that was like the second biggest, largest deal of raising. I have originally bootstrapped my company to over $10 million, but as of now, my company has reached over $85 million in revenue. So Ruby Love is period apparel. I am the inventor. I'm not an inventor of period underwear, but I do have a patent that I actually wrote myself on the gusset of our underwear, but I am the inventor of period swimwear, sleepwear, and activewear. Women everywhere are very grateful. And Calvin. No, I'm Calvin Souter. Uh, I'm the managing partner of a law firm called Souter, Shabazz, and Woolridge. Um, We're based out of Newark, New Jersey, um, but we are a national firm. My day-to-day is uh, helping to rebuild cities across America. Uh, So think, you know, large buildings that you see coming up in different, mainly minority neighborhoods. Um, I help navigate that process for both the politicians as well as the private sector. So that's kind of me, and, and it's become my purpose. Um, It's more than about just money to me. Thank you guys so much for that introduction. Okay, so as I was preparing for these questions and what I was going to ask, I'm coming from a background of like, I get people divorced. (laughs) So I'm not great at like figuring out what's working in your marriage and how is that like, you know, making you guys money and how how does that look? I see the other side of it. So um, I wanted just to kind of ask both of you to tell us a little bit about your current partner and what it was about that person that made that switch go off in your brain and was like, this is the one I need to bind myself to. I'll go. Now I can talk about my husband all the time. (laughs) That you can ask me anything, I got a lot to say about that. (laughs) When I met my husband, me and him both were going through a divorce. I didn't know he was going through a divorce, he didn't know I was going through a divorce. My mother had just died um, from a sudden heart attack, maybe like a week and a half before that. She died the day after Whitney Houston, literally the day after that, so whatever year that was. Um, And I met my husband like a week and a half. My friend had dragged me out the house. She said, because I'm always bubbly, she's like, you just look depressed. Like, you just look bad. Like, get your stuff on, and like, we need to just go somewhere. So um, we went to, I met my husband at the club. (laughs) So, 
So she dragged me to like some lounge club and I'm just, usually I'm like jumping on tables. But that night I wasn't because I was like depressed. Um, he came in, it was actually his birthday. It was his 40th birthday and he was dancing on the tables, like acting crazy. Um, and I just was looking at him. I was like, oh my God, like this, this is the guy. Like, I really like this guy. Like he didn't know it. He was like, acting like seriously, like really crazy, like with the dancing, all types of stuff. It was his 40th birthday, so you could just imagine. And I just said, you know what, I like this guy. Like I really, really like him. So he comes over and he asks me, um, what do you want to drink? I said, I don't want your drink. Like trying to be nasty. Because I was just going through another divorce. I, I was already in a divorce with my husband that I was with since I was 14 years old. So I was like, okay, like I'm in this divorce. I just want to be single, but I liked him. I was like, oh, that's my type of guy. So um, he brought the drink anyway, left it on the bar and left. So I was like, oh, I really like him now. <laughs> so when I got my, when me and my friends were leaving, his friend came up to me and was like, oh, like, where do you live? I told him I live in Long Island. And then he was like, his friend said, um, let me have your number. I said, well, I don't want your number. I want your friend's number. And he went and got his friend and we've been together ever since. Awesome. Did you have Ruby Love at that point? You I did it? not. I was in okay. corporate. Perfect. So then you guys later built, I definitely don't want to take away from you if it was all you, but did you build the brand together? No. It took, Just no. Like I had my that when I first met my husband, my husband actually had his own business. And I was actually in corporate. I was a controller, like running financials, like an accounting office. And um, it took me like a few years to convince my husband to come into my business. My husband is Haitian. So he's like, you know, like they're just, the way they're raised, a Haitian person. Is anybody here Haitian? Oh, really? No, stop, I say. But <laughs> yes. So um, the Haitian culture is very, very like, you know, you just become a doctor or a lawyer or you own your own business. And he definitely wasn't gonna come work in his wife's business. He actually told me not. I remember the day that I came up with the idea of writing the patent for my business. Uh, we were already uh, married at that time. And he came home and I was like, oh my God, I got this great idea, look at this. I had it drawn on the paper, like a hole in underwear. And he was like, I don't think, I think you should go back to work. <laughs> and I tease him about this all the time because now we're, in the business together and you know, running a $85 million company. So I tease him about that all the time. But it took me a few years to convince him, probably like about two and a half years to like shut his business down, sell all of his trucks. He was in logistics and then he finally came Interesting. into my business. Okay, cool. We're gonna circle back to that, but I do wanna hear Calvin's story because he has a really good story about his wife. Go ahead. I mean, I don't know if meeting my wife was that interesting. Um, she, she managed the building that I lived in, um, and she was a new manager, so I was living there when she, when she took the job. I was in a very, I'll call it, unapologetic stage of my life. Um, I was engaged beforehand, um, and when that didn't work out, I was kind of like, I'm never getting married. Um, and my conversation with women at the time was very much so like, listen, I work a lot. Um, I'm really busy. If you want to hang out sometimes, let's hang out. If you don't, we don't have to. Um, I'll go hang out with somebody else. Um, and just to be clear, um, I do like to go to nice restaurants. I like to do things like go to museums and art galleries and things like that. Um, but I should tell you up front that like, I'm not the guy who does that with you because I'm trying to do something extra special. Like That's just who I am. So don't take that to mean, like, I don't want to be in the chat with your friends to be like, oh, he's doing all this extra stuff. Calvin was doing what Calvin wanted to do. Actually, in, in meeting each other, our first conversation was an argument. Um, I had a motorcycle that I parked somewhere. One of my neighbors didn't like it. The neighbor said something. I didn't care for the neighbor. So you can imagine how the conversation went. I didn't care. I was living in a luxury building. I was like, this is what I negotiated for. I am an attorney, so I was like, you could go screw yourself. Um, and then I learned she was a very, not only was she a beautiful woman, she was a very strong woman, and she was able to, to deal with it, and she had to deal with me in the building. Um, and over time, you know, it turned into a little something else. Very, very cool. Um, okay, so 
Let's chat really quickly, Crystal, about you mentioned your previous marriage. And I don't want to get too delicate with anything you don't feel comfortable sharing. But being as though that was a really long relationship for you, what like top two things that you learned that you didn't want in a relationship from that one? Um, one was a cheater. <laughs> That's number one. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> But I forgive my ex-husband, because like I said, we were together since I was 14, he was 15. We have two beautiful children. Um, we were together for a very long time. So, and he just cheated on me. He just cheated, cheated, cheated. And I think what I learned from that relationship is that you need to learn when to say, like enough is enough. Like it was because we were 14 and 15, I thought that's who I'm gonna you know, die with. And I knew that it was just like, like when I had, like a little before I had my daughter, like I knew that it wasn't right. Even when I got married and walked down the aisle, like I knew walking down the aisle, like I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Like I was like, you know what? Like all of this is beautiful, like this big, huge wedding, like a $50,000 wedding, but I, I just didn't feel right. And I think that's, it taught me like just to let go when you know it's wrong. And when I finally let go, it led me to happiness. And I didn't even realize, like during that relationship, like me and my husband, my ex-husband, we were always like had more than our friends. We were always like considered like the power couple or like, you know, when you, people have been together since they're like teenagers, like, oh my God, like they're together. It's such a beautiful relationship. But my daughter told me probably like 10 years ago, she was like, mom, you were depressed. <laughs> And I was like, how did you know that? She was like, because I didn't know that I was depressed. But I was dealing with like and ushering out so much energy into that with someone cheating, someone not, um, like he just wasn't the man for me. But I do forgive him. I have to speak to him. I still got to deal with him because we have two children. And we're like, we really kind of were more like brother and sister in that way. So we do have a good relationship now, but I would never ever choose him as a husband ever again. And he knows it. <laughs> what do you think the dynamic is? So since like you obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm probably making a lot of assumptions here, but it seems like once you got rid of him, life like really picked up in a positive way. Like you met this amazing man and then you built this $85 million company. So I guess like what part of that, like, is he jealous? That's what I really want to know. Like, does he, is he jealous? So, okay, so everyone in my family says that he probably wants to take a Mack truck and run it through our house. I say, no, 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 so no, 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 no. His fiance is actually an um, obstetrician, gynecologist. Um, they live in Park Slope. They, he still lives very, like, he lives very well. Like, but not $85 million well. No. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, I think it's just a lot like my husband like when they're around each other I can tell like there's probably some tension not uh, not tension I can just tell because I just know him because we were together since we were children so I just know him that he tries to like you know he talks about his like obstetrician wife and I mean his fiance and all that stuff and my husband literally he does not care like he's just like okay like are you coming get your son <laughs> You want me to drop him off? You know what I mean? Um, so he does do things. Like, say if my ex-husband gets... A, a good example is my daughter just graduated from law school in May. Yep. Which is our child together. So we had a graduation party for her. And my daughter, for her graduation party, she brought herself... She didn't do it with me. She brought herself a Porsche 911. So at her graduation party... Like, we already knew this. My daughter is, like, so, like, an introvert. At her graduation party, her father, my ex-husband, gets on the mic and says, congratulations to my daughter. And he goes, now we got the same car. <laughs> we didn't know he had a Porsche. Like, we didn't care. Like, we could care less. And um, <laughs> my daughter said later on, like, I don't know why he did that. And she said, I think he did that not for me to tell you, like my husband. So we just think it's funny. So he does do things. Um, because I never cheated on him. I was a great wife and he just was a cheater. Like he literally was just a cheater. And I think, I think as he's gotten older, he realized like he had a good woman and I think he's still like chasing that. 
and his current fiance, she's a great woman. Like she works all the time. He still cheat on her. That I don't know. Probably he's a to me. If you ask me, I'm the wrong person to ask. Yes, he does. <laughs> Never stop cheating on me. So <laughs> why would it stop? <laughs> Maybe you can get her um, gynecology office to carry your period underwear, and that would just be like full circle. No, she has asked. Me and her have. She have a good relationship, so we have. And she doesn't have any kids. She doesn't want any kids. Um, she is fine with my two kids. My daughter's 26. My son is 16, and. So to answer your question, my family says there's some animosity. I don't really see it because I don't really pay attention to them. Well, you're living above it. You know, you got to like look down yeah, and be really like, oh, you're bothered. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, Calvin, I want to talk to you a little bit about, so obviously you are, you're a founding member of the law firm that is expanding. Um, how did you and your wife navigate that specifically the long hours, the time, the energy that goes into that, I'm very well aware, so I want to hear this. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Ooh, this is really good. You should know about this. So I don't know about you, but I've been known to procrastinate, especially when things scare the hell out of me. The fear alone would have me stuck, overwhelmed, confused, and all types of self-doubt. And don't even get me started on the imposter syndrome. Oh, Okay. After getting laid off, not once, but three times, honey, Ew. I realized that the security blanket that I made up in my head was just an excuse because I didn't really want to bet on myself. The corporate benefits that had me in that headlock, girl, huh, they went out the window once my job decided that they no longer needed me. It turns out that I'll save a whole nickel if I cut your salary completely. The truth is, the only security blanket guarantee is the one that you create for yourself. In other words, until you start a business, you will always be at the mercy of a company's headcount and you will never have complete control over your time, which means you'll be renting out your thought leadership and helping build someone else's dream instead of your own. If you've been waiting for a sign, this is it. Don't you think it's time you stop playing small and tap all the way into your power sis? Click on the link above or below this video to learn my three step process, the exact three steps that I took to make the transition from corporate to entrepreneurship. And this is helpful even if you don't know what type of business to start and have only one source of income. And this is absolutely free. It is my gift to you. I want you to win. It's winning season. In fact, what's that? It smells like winning season. Okay, so tap in and I'll see you inside the training. Let's go. It was rough. Um, you know, I give my wife credit though. Um, when, when we met, I was working in what we call big law, right? One of the, you know, big New York City. We were basically, we were really based out of DC. So I was traveling back and forth all the time between DC and New Jersey. And I had assignments that would take me regularly to Ecuador and Brazil. Um, I did a lot of work in Africa at the time. So I was, all, you know, the nature of our relationship when we first got together is she knew that I was prone to be on a plane and going for a week or two at a time. Um, and then I made a decision to open up my own firm, which was kind of like, you know, there's a lot of safety in big law. I was up for partner. It was clear that they were going to make me partner. You know, they were doing all of the courting her at the time, which was, you know, she was still, you know, my girlfriend, but everybody kind of knew. So the firm was spending money on courting her to try to make it all. And I came home one day and was like, I think I want to do this on my own um, and try to figure it out. And she was supportive of that. So we had an initial conversation that, you know, all the books tell you it takes you five years until you really know what's going on with your business. So the conversation was like, hey, for the next five years, I'm gonna be working a lot. There's gonna be this, that, and the third. Um, I started the business in my house, like literally on my dining room table. Um, went from the dining room table to the third floor to a small office. And then it kind of just kept going. And although I wasn't traveling internationally as much, I found myself working to two, three, four o'clock in the morning, getting up at five, six o'clock in the morning and doing it all over again. So I think anyone who's in a relationship knows the stress that that can put on a family, right? Um, we have four children too, right? So um, what I would say is you, you gotta be open and honest about what's really happening in your life, right? Um, and then you have at least the possibility of navigating it together, right? Um, so it was always, hey, I got this going on, I got that going on. 
so she had an, a, a pretty good idea when I would be coming home late. Now she'll tell you that she just doesn't expect me to be home at any given time. It's just easier for her to deal with it mentally that way. Um, but we try to have very open communication about what's going on. And, and, I, and I think it's also fair to note that my wife is an executive in her own right, right? So she's a C-level executive of one of the largest real estate development companies in the United States. She runs their Northeast portfolio, which includes New York City, Stanford, Connecticut, like some of the biggest cities on the East Coast. Um, so she's busy too, right? So it helps that we can have a conversation about what it's like to be a boss somewhere and the responsibilities. Like she's got employees underneath her. They're, she's not paying them, but she can kind of, right? She, she knows how much all those people are making. So she looks at my business, she goes, well, <laughs> you got an overhead of X, right? And I like to travel and do all of these other things that you got to pay for, so you got to go to work. Um, so there's, there's some realism in that. And then there's the realistic, she's a woman, right? So she's going to be emotional about certain things and there's going to be times where she's, you know, we need to talk about this because you were gone for two weeks and I thought you were going to be gone for a week and a half or in February of 2024, she already knows like I'm gone for the month of February. Um, so there's, the, you know, you got to listen, <laughs> uh, talk, right? I think the biggest thing I learned in being a father and a husband was sometimes you just got to hear it. Like you don't always want an outcome from your significant others. Sometimes you just want your significant other to hear you genuinely. And I think once she realized that I would take the time to sit down and hear all of whatever it is and then not turn around and be like, yeah, but don't you want to go to Italy? <laughs> right? Like none of that makes any sense. Like, no, there's validity in how you feel, even though we're doing it for a purpose and everything else. So I think that's always helped us. I remember we've, we've had some very long <laughs> conversations about different things. And I just say sometimes you just gotta sit and listen, yeah. right? And 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 then be open. And like if you're going a lot, right? I've I've changed the way that I do certain things, and and not always to the to the benefit of her being able to turn around and say like you did it perfectly, right? Or that solved the problem. But her knowing that I've taken steps to try to solve the problem, right, has been very beneficial. So I used to work all the time and all weekend long. Now I was, I'd say I might work an extra hour or two each night, Monday through Friday, but Saturday and Sunday, I am not leaving the house. Like that's, that's for my family. Everyone knows that. Um, certain vacations that I've put in place for, for my family now. So my kids look forward to spending a few weeks on Martha's Vineyard every year. Um, and my wife knows that we'll go away and take at least a week that's just us well, I'm not answering telephones, I'm not responding to people, regardless of what the deal is that's going on, right? So, and she knows that's hard for me, yeah. right? It gets really hard, but, um, but I do it, and she knows it doesn't solve the problem, but she knows that I'm working towards trying to make it better. I love that, I love that. Yeah, that's really, yeah. I wanna go to Martha's Vineyard for six weeks. <laughs> um, okay, let's, let's get dirty and talk about money. Um, as someone, like I said, who just went into business with my husband, um, I've had my business for 12 years coming up. So in our dynamic, everything was always separate. And, you know, if I wanted to go spend money on clothes or whatever I wanted, there was never a discussion. In fact, I kind of would be like, don't worry about it. It's not your money. You know, don't worry about it. Well, now that he's bought into my business, I can't say that anymore because it is his money and that's uncomfortable and a learning curve. So I guess like, let's talk about the things people never can talk about. Like what, what conversation did you sit down with your spouse and say, like, how are we going to handle our finances and how are we going to handle the firm or Ruby Love's finances? And like, what are we going to prioritize? How is that going to happen while still living a beautiful life of excess? Yeah. So Ruby Love is a corporation. It's, completely different than my personal life. I always tell everyone, um, my personal life is beautiful. I have no issues. It's absolutely wonderful. My personal life. But when you get to Ruby Love as a business, and especially a monster that is just a machine, like keep going and keep going and keep has going. to be fed all the time. Yeah. All the time. So that is something that me and my husband deal with. But in our personal life, our 
finances, everything is completely wonderful. But when we get on the conversation of Ruby Love, um, I think when we had this conversation, I explained that me and my husband went into it when I brought him into my business. Um, I had enough respect for him because he had his own business and he was leaving his own business behind. But I knew that I needed him like excessively. We made an agreement that um, you handle these things and I handled mine. And then you have to remember that I said I raised a VC round in 2019. So now you are including another relationship into that there. So it has always worked out where my husband was in charge of the back, I am in charge of the front, and whatever that decision is, whether you agree with it or not, whoever is in charge of that has the last say. And you can't, you can't say anything. And many times, he has done stuff. I've warned him, and then he learned. And the same thing, not as many as his, but there has been times that um, I'll go into his office and I'll be like you, like, you just shouldn't do that. And he's like, well, I'm going to do it. And I just have to walk out and I have to accept it. And then he has to deal with the consequence in the other way around. And that has made it like very well. So we, we know that our business is a completely different thing than our personal life. And that has worked very well. Do you see your business as like, a third person in your marriage or like an additional child? Absolutely not. Calvin's <laughs> eyes, he was like, it's, the, it's my second wife. It's my business. I know it. <laughs> your wife would agree, I'm sure. Yeah, his is very service-based, so it's yeah. different. But for when you have a consumer product and it's a corporation, we don't. I think a lot of people make that mistake and then you see it as, oh my God, we need to, like, that's, no. Like, that is something completely completely different just out of curiosity because i'm ignorant to all of this what does like what did you delegate to him and what do you handle oh, yes so when i say the back we used to have a fulfillment we used to have 54 employees and the majority of those employees used to be in the back end which was logistics inventory fulfillment my husband handled that because that's what his his background, background was in was in fulfillment and things like that mine was in the front which is handling customer service um, accounting, anything on the front end, marketing, I was in charge of. Gotcha. So, like, I guess, because when you're saying let him, like, own his mistake if he makes a bad one, in my mind, I'm like, that would also affect me. Like, it's not going to unilaterally just be, like, his problem, you know, it, it could bleed over. No, it definitely is not his problem. So, for instance, I said I handle customer service, he handled, was in charge of fulfillment. Those two departments never get along. Like, in no company. <laughs> he used to tell customer service, me, you know, the people that I was running, um, like, if my department don't make the mistakes, you won't have a job. And he's right. The chicken or the egg. <laughs> yeah, so those two departments never get along. So it was always decisions on, you know, dealing with employees or, you know, within those departments. Those are decisions that it, it just never gets along, but you just have to respect what that is. Who makes the decisions about employees, or do you all just defer to HR? So that would be HR. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. That's helpful to know. Okay, Calvin, tell me about your second wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my wife would probably say that she's the second wife to the business, um, if I'm being realistic, right, and, and acknowledging some of the things that we have to work through. Um, but the, the money piece, we've always kept it separate. Um, I, I think it was just, my, my wife was married before, so I think that in the beginning of our relationship, that colored a lot of the conversation around money, and she went through a really bad divorce, um, where she was left holding the bag, right? So um, she was very protective of it. I personally am not a, I like my money, right? Um, it's not the driving force in my life, so um, I'm not as protective of it as she was at the time. Um, and, and as we've gone through life, I mean, we've, we've both always done pretty well. Um, and throughout the duration of our relationship, I've made more money, but she's made significantly more money over that time, right? Even though that my, my income has gone up significantly as well. Um, you know, we end up squabbling about certain little things. Um, like what? Like, let's. 
Give us an example. What's the last thing you and your wife fought over that was money related? Oh, I mean, I, so I just bought a new car. Um, Ooh, what kind of car did you buy? <laughs> um, so I just bought this new new BMW um, with all the bells and whistles or whatnot. And she kind of looked at me and was like, well, I want this and you're going to buy it. And I looked at her and was like, nah, no, I'm not. Um, but you can have it. God bless you. Go buy it um, if that's what you want. Um, so there's like little things like that because there is a disparity. Um, and we've talked about it. And this is one of the things that I think, you know, you found interesting. Um, you know, I can go out and, you know, I'm known to do it. I'm a real estate attorney. So sometimes if I do a big deal, I'll have a payday, some, you know, a couple times a year. That is, that is, that's nice. Um, so I might buy myself something. I might go and, you know, you know guys who like nice things, I might go buy a watch. They both love cars. Well, her husband loves cars. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and they can be expensive. And she's like, well, you just decided to go out and, you know, buy that, you know, very expensive BMW. Or you came home and you spent six figures on a watch. Like, you didn't call. You didn't, like, nothing. Like, you just came home with it. And I'm like, yeah, well, I felt like I earned it. So that's what it is. Um, but... On the flip side of that, though, I take care of everything that I feel like I'm supposed to take care of, and it's it's worked, right? Like, I honestly, I just feel like I'm just a man in the relationship, right? So the mortgage, I still, you know, I don't ask my wife for money on the when it comes to the mortgage, or, and she's upset about the car that I bought myself, but, you know, I bought her car, right? It's not like I made her go and figure out getting the car. I bought her car. She, we, huh? No, nah, it wasn't a peace gift. What, what, you know quiet. what it is? We, we live different lives, right? And I think you all know, like, men tend to think a little bit more logically, right? So I look at my wife, and I'm like, you want a $300,000 vehicle, but you drive 150,000 miles a year. It's not practical. It's ridiculous, right? Like, I'm not doing that for you. You could get a Cherokee and put as many miles on it as you want to, and I won't care, right? Yes, yeah, a Cherokee, right? I know billionaires who drive Cherokees, right? But it's about the mileage, right? And I was like, you can have a more expensive car if you leave it at home and then just drive it on the weekends and do stuff like that. And then she had a test run with a very expensive vehicle, and then she realized that she didn't like looking around and checking the shoulder and stuff, right? Because now people are stealing cars at a much higher rate, and the car that I have is the type of car that people have, you know, they routinely break into people's homes to steal the cars. And, so she had one for like three months, and she was like, "I just just nervous everywhere I go." And I'm like, uh -uh. "That was a waste, right?" Like, <laughs> um, so we get into those a, a, a little bit. But what I've learned is, as long as I like take care of what I'm supposed to take care of, and two or three times a year show it with a bag or a pair of shoes or something. It works out, right? Like, I wish my husband would do that. I'm definitely the spender. So I guess in my relationship, I am the dreamer. Like, I'm the one that, that always wants more. And it's not that I'm, like, not happy. I feel like this is a safe place to talk about this. Like, it's okay to like nice things and to want those in your life and to to not feel bad about want it, wanting it. That was one of my, my things I wrote down that I feel that I have to quiet myself because I want things. And I want I want a happy life. I want my family to be, you know, taken care of and healthy. But which, like, I guess it, my husband is always the logical one that's like, well, let's maybe wait on this. And I'm like, oh, no, we got to do this. And in, in all reality, he, he kicks himself because, like, for instance, in 2021, um, I, I just was like on Zillow board and was like, I want to buy this really expensive house. And it was like three times the price of the house we were living in. And I had no idea that we, we could afford that. In fact, he told me we couldn't afford it. And then I, being me, was like, I'm going to ask somebody that really knows. And so I asked my accountant and my banker. And he was like, yeah, that's actually a great idea. The interest rates are really low. And so I like bulldozed him and we custom built our dream home that we now have a million dollars in equity in right before the rates went up to 8%. So how do you balance like who's the dreamer and who's the one that's kind of reining you in? Or are you both dreamers? And how does that work? So in my relationship, <laughs> my husband, actually ever since this last conversation that we had on the phone, my, my husband has added another car that I told you, it's a Maybach, <laughs> to the nice car. Rasta. My husband has every dream car you can think of. Like, literally every dream car you can think of except a Bugatti. I told him I will, like, kick that ass. 
if you come with that. So he has, at one point, we, right now I think we have five cars, but at one point we had seven cars. My, my husband is a car person. He is hands down a car person. Like I said, we have every, Ferrari, like we have it. But like when he does these things, it doesn't bother me because we have built up a life even before we were together, like where we are able to do those things. My husband, when we, how we ended up, I'll give you a good story of what happens all the time because it just happened after this call that we had. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Ooh, this is really good. You should know about this. So I don't know about you, but I've been known to procrastinate. It's Especially when things scare the hell out of me. The fear alone would have me stuck, overwhelmed, confused, and all types of self-doubt. And don't even get me started on the imposter syndrome. Okay. okay. After getting laid off, not once, but three times, honey. I realized that the security blanket that I made up in my head was just an excuse because I didn't really want to bet on myself. The corporate benefits that had me in that headlock, girl, huh, they went out the window once my job decided that they no longer needed me. Turns out that I'll save a whole nickel if I cut your salary completely. The truth is, the only security blanket guarantee is the one that you create for yourself. In other words, until you start a business, you will always be at the mercy of a company's headcount and you will never have complete control over your time, which means you'll be renting out your thought leadership and helping build someone else's dream instead of your own. If you've been waiting for a sign, this is it. Don't you think it's time you stop playing small and tap all the way into your power sis? Click on the link above or below this video to learn my three step process, the exact three steps that I took to make the transition from corporate to entrepreneurship. And this is helpful even if you don't know what type of business to start and have only one source of income. And this is absolutely free. It is my gift to you. I want you to win. It's winning season. In fact, what's that? It smells like winning season. Okay, so tap in and I'll see you inside the training. Let's go. My husband drove to Connecticut and we went to, we actually went to, um, I think um, Bentley first. So he's like, oh, I'm just gonna drive up. We live in Long Island. He, drove to some place in Connecticut. So he's like, oh, I'm gonna go down the block. They had the car sitting there. So when I walked in, I said, oh my God, this is nice. Like, I like the strip going down. Two hours later, we, walk, we were driving home with the car. He does this to me all the time, but I know that that's what he likes. We can afford to do it. Um, I think as you get older, I think um, as you start to satisfy your life, I think that it doesn't hurt. Just like of you saying like that you went and got the car that you got, like it didn't hurt anything. I think, I think it's more of like what we deal with in the past. Like maybe that's why your wife had a problem with it because of what she dealt with in the past, but you got it and everything is fine. So that's how I've always viewed things. Like, that's what he likes. Like, I like bags. Like, I'm a very, very big bag person. He could care less. He doesn't complain, like, if I go and buy a bag. Like, he could care less. I have, like, over 70 of them. And he doesn't understand. Like, I see them as assets. He doesn't see them that way. But I literally, they, bags really are assets. Assets are different. But he doesn't understand it that way. Just like I would never understand his car fetish. Like, I just, I just won't. He brought me, like how you said you brought your wife a fancy car. I know the feeling because sometimes if we're in my Range Rover that he brought me, like, it's a $180,000 car. I feel like your wife. Like, oh, my God, I can't ride here. Like, today I drove my Mini. I told him last year I want a cheap car no one's going to see me in. So for Christmas, he brought me a Mini Cooper, and I love it. It's my favorite car. Like literally, I could park it anywhere. I'm not worried about anybody knocking me over my head. I would never, ever understand the car fetish. I just, I just won't. But I understand that and I respect him for that. And when he gets something, I just know that like, yes, like, like I don't care, but I also know that it'd be okay. Just like you have your car and you have your cars and you have whatever you have and everything turned out fine. So I think that um, that's just always been my personality. And in our relationship, how you said that you, your husband is the one that holds things back, like my husband is a spender, he knows it. I'm not the spender, he's the spender. And I knew that from a year in that we were together and I had to make the decision, am I okay with being with that type of person? 
And that is where we just ignore things like, oh, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to change him. I just thought, am I okay with being with that type of person? So I knew that I had to handle things financially differently because he doesn't think that way. You can't change like how someone, you just cannot. And it's funny because in our last, my last relationship with my um, ex-husband, I actually was the spender. Like my husband would have never ever brought uh, Mercedes. I used to want a Mercedes all the time. He's like, drive think, this Mazda. Sorry to interrupt you. Do you think that maybe you were the spender in that relationship because you weren't getting emotionally fulfilled or you felt... No. Was, no? I've just never... I just never have been. And I still think I am a, a um, spender, just not... like Your husband's how, level. <laughs> yes. Like, my ex-husband, like, the Porsche that I told you, he didn't go to Porsche and buy it. He brought it from, like, the auction. Like, he's still the same way. And me, at that time, it was just a different thought set. Like, I didn't want that because I wanted, like, in that relationship, I wanted a reliable car. I don't want a car from the auction. I don't care what it is. Like, I want to go to the dealership and get my nice, shiny car. You know, I don't really care what it is. Just get me that. So it's just a different mindset of, like, dealing with people. And you just have to accept people for who they are. In a year in, like I said, I knew my husband was a spender. Like, literally... My husband will just see something. He won't even think it. He'll just buy it if he likes it. And I, he still does it. Like, and I'm okay with it because I just accept him for who he is. Because when he does that, I already done planned out something totally different where that, that, is, like, that purchase is not going to hurt us. And I think your car example is the same. Your car didn't hurt. But for your wife, it was like, oh, my God, like the, the fear of it. What's the thing about buying the nice car but not driving it or putting a lot of miles on it? I, I mean, it's just the, yeah, I don't understand that. It's the, it, <laughs> like drive the car. So like. I, I think I can explain it better <clears throat> in the way I like to spend money just in general, right? So I, I, I consider myself an asset purchaser, not just a spender, right? So I don't mind going to buy my wife certain bags and stuff. I'm probably bigger on bags than I am on shoes. Um, and jewelry, right? Because they are things that you can pass down to your children. Some of these bags and stuff, depending on the brand and how many they make, right? Like, you know, if you ever, I would have never thought I'd want to invest in like a Hermes bag, right? But my wife has one, not because it was just like, I want to just spend some money. Do right? you let her carry it? She could do whatever she, she can carry it. <laughs> right? Like, she just doesn't carry it as much as someone would, would think, but then you end up having a bunch of different bags, right? So, I mean, it, it, it works out. And once we, once she understood that I was really an asset purchaser, right? Like, that I just wasn't spending crazy money on artwork that came into the house, right? That there was a, something behind it, right? And as my art collection grew and it became worth more money and different people need to come into your home to appraise it, she's like, oh, wait a second, you know? Um, or like the investment into a safe in the wall for your watches, right? And that insurance policy comes through and she's like, wait, like this is worth what? Like, and it increases in value, right? And I don't go and I may like a particular watch, but if it has no future asset value to it, I'm not buying it, right? So, and the same is with cars, right? So there's that 911, right? But if you were to get a, a I love Porsches too. Um, <laughs> But if you got, if you spent the three hundred and some odd thousand on a GT3, you understand that they're only going to make hundred, a hundred of them in a year. Right. And you understand that the certain type of fuel injection or whatever, like Porsche is not going to make any more fuel injected cars after next year. A lot of people are going to buy Porsches this year because those cars are going to be extremely valuable thirty years from now, right? And if you do well for yourself, I think you should be thinking about the assets that you have. Right, as you continue to move through life, right? Like, what are, am I, you shouldn't just leave all of your money in the bank. Like, that's one of the most foolish things that you can do. But if you're investing in things, what is the, what are, how can you enjoy your money, right? And still be able to get something long term out of it, right? So, you come in my office, you find art all over the place, right? I got more watches than most people would ever think to want to buy. And I'll, I'll buy more. Right, but as she's come to understand that there's a value add to it, it's, it's gotten a lot easier. But we've also sat down and said, 
what are some of the things that you need to make you comfortable financially? So like, as these, as you see these things happen, you won't cringe as much, right? So whether it's our real estate portfolio that generates income for us, um, you know, the different accounts that are doing different things that she has access to, and then just like an emergency fund, right? What happens if Calvin doesn't come home tomorrow, right? You don't want to necessarily wait for an insurance company to, you know, whatever, and whatever they're going to say. So there's a, a pile of money sitting somewhere for that emergency parachute. There's different things that she sees around, like, and she understands them a little bit better now. When I come home with a new bag and it might be something that she didn't necessarily think about, she actually will go look it up now and, and try to figure it out. And I've introduced her to vintage luxury goods dealers. Um, and she's like, I didn't realize that if you had a Louis Vuitton bag from 1978 that was a whatever, that's worth tens of thousands of dollars now, right? So shifting the mindset and communicating so that there can at least be some understanding around what it is that you're doing and why. I love that. I feel like the mindset and really the communication, because sometimes being a divorce lawyer, some people just speak different languages. They're both speaking English, but they're not on the same page. And that is so true because you can say something in one way and it just go completely over someone's head. But when you say it in a way that they can be receptive to, that's the key, I think, to a healthy healthy, happy, successful marriage. Well, you guys, this was a great panel. I think I'm reading that right, right, Kara? Okay. Um, thank you guys so much. This was so entertaining. We can close it out with just a fun, like, what was the most recent fun, lavish gift you bought yourself? Right. Or for your spouse, yourself or your spouse? Um, say that Maybach that we brought together. <laughs> it's ours. <laughs> like, we don't really buy, like, we buy each other gifts or things so he'll come home, but we don't really buy each other stuff, I would say. We just get, like, what we know is nice. Like, I don't want my husband buying me any bag at all. He still will try. And it's not my favorites. So of what I brought myself, I can't even think of anything that I have brought myself. Calvin, what about you? Any new watches? No, no new watches. Um, I think I said I just bought a new car. But I think my, my favorite most recent purchase um as i alluded to i like art um and i've you know the art world kind of graduates you into different things so i've recently been able to uh buy some originals from some some of the world's most renowned living artists um so uh two artists uh frank morrison and marcus jansen just released some original artwork to me um so that to me is incredible um, <laughs> and that it's at my you know in my house or in my office um, that my kids will be able to have one day but the, the fact that people can walk in see it understand why somebody would like me would, would want it and, and not even necessarily understand what they're looking at or like what the cost of it was because that really wasn't the the point so I, I would say you know my, my latest uh, Frank Morrison and, and Marcus Jensen artwork that is so cool I need to buy some art I need to to invest in. We all should buy art. Yes, everybody buy art. Thank you guys so much for being on the panel. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Espérate, espérate. Let, hold up. Let's roll this back for a second. Have you hit the subscribe button? Are you making sure you're tuning in every Tuesday when we drop a new episode? Y'all, you don't know how important it is for you guys to not only tune in, but leave us your feedback. I want to make sure that we are providing value. I want to make sure that we are providing content that is really resonating with you. And the only way for us to know that is to hear from you. So make sure to subscribe and leave your feedback after the episode. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, I'm pretty sure you're going to love the next one. So make sure to click right here and tap in to the next episode.